Well, good morning. As Eric said earlier, my name's Danny Myers, and what a joy to be here this morning. Thank you, Mike, and your session for bringing me. Uh, he asked me to give you a quick bio, and I think the best bio I could give you kind of ties into what we're going to read this morning here in Mark chapter 1. I'm from Marietta. I went to Wheeler High School. Don't hold that against me out here. Uh, but went to Wheeler. My wife went to Harrison. We both went to school at Georgia Southern University. That's where I came to know Christ. And after Georgia Southern, we went on staff with the Christian ministry called Campus Outreach. And we spent about two and a half years at Valdosta State, and then we moved into real pagan country into Columbia, and we started the ministry at the University of South Carolina. And <laughs> thank you. Well, they did beat Georgia. Uh, they just lost miserably yesterday. Um, but you know, everywhere I go, I've learned that there's no more important question than who is Jesus. I really don't think you've ever considered the weight of that question. My point to you this morning is to say how you answer that will change everything about your life. And that's not just for you. That's for the world. You, you see, if you ask the question, who is Jesus, and you decide he is not the Son of God, he is not who he said he was, it's going to affect every decision you make. But if you do decide, and you do believe that he is who he said he was, will it not affect every decision in your life? And so when we ask that question this morning, who is Jesus? I want you to kind of embrace the weight for a moment because eternity hangs in the balance and not just way down there, but today, every decision you make is affected by how you answer this question. And so this morning, I want to look in Mark's gospel. We'll look in chapter one. We'll read the first 13 verses. Follow along with me. This is God's word. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all, and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down, and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Let's pray together real quick. God, we, we live in a world that, easy, that makes it easy to be distracted. We are easily distracted. And so we pray, even this morning, would you free us from distraction? Would you do so that we, that we might see Jesus? And even as David would say, O oh Lord, would the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be honoring in your sight, my Lord and my rock and my redeemer. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before we go too far in, let me give you a little bit of context because I recognize you're probably not studying the book of Mark. And so before we kind of look exactly what he's saying, I want to kind of help you understand where are we? Well, if, if tradition holds true, and I think it does, in the early church fathers, we would recognize the gospel of Mark being written by John Mark. Now, he would be the scribe of the apostle Peter, and that's the one you recognize would be an eyewitness, right, of the Lord Jesus, of his life, his death, and even his resurrection. 
And when Mark is writing, he's writing to Gentiles. And to make that clear, when we're talking about Gentiles, this is what it looks like. There's Jews and everybody else. Okay? So there's Jews and then there's Gentiles. And he's writing predominantly to Roman Gentiles. Now, why do you and I need to know that? Because when you look in the very first two verses, you're going to see this phrase. Mark says, as it is written in Isaiah. Gentiles aren't quite clear on Jewish tradition. So why would Mark say that? This is the only Old Testament citation in Mark's gospel that he records. Every other Old Testament citation in the entire gospel comes from the mouth of Jesus. And so therefore, when he's quoting the Old Testament, there's something significant for you and I. And that's what he's going to point out is why do we refer to the Old Testament here? So he's writing to Gentiles and he's going to tell them something specific that comes out of the Old Testament. So let us look for three things this morning. When we ask the question, who is Jesus? Three things. Jesus is supreme. Jesus is the Savior. And Jesus is the sufferer. Look with me. Jesus is supreme. Notice how Mark begins. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. What, what is Mark beginning with? He's telling you he is God's son. Now, why is that important? When you look in culture and society in that time, when you would hear a phrase like, this is someone's son, they recognize that to be in same nature of. And that's not too odd. We say things like that, don't we? We say things like, you know, that little boy, he's a spitting image of his dad. Or maybe you've said this, or if you're like me, it's been said to you, you know, when you grow up, I hope you have kids just like you. Now, when I heard that, I, I thought, man, that'd be a good thing. I'm a pretty cool kid. And now I have three boys, and I have since recognized how foolish I was as a child. And so, but that, that's the point. That's what Mark is saying here. When he says that he is the son of God, he's giving you not just a substance of quality, he's giving you a ranking. That's what supreme means. When we say it's something supreme, we're not just saying it's of high substance. We're saying it's of high ranking. And so when Mark tells you that he is God's son, he wants you to recognize something very specific about him. He is God. He is the highest of high, the king of kings. And that's what Mark is trying to drive home in the very first verse. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. Now, when you read it, doesn't it sound strange that that's what he says in verse 1? And then immediately, verse 2, he quotes Isaiah the prophet. If you've ever read the gospel of Mark, you recognize he uses the word immediately a lot. He kind of seems like an anxious writer. And so he's just told you that God is, Jesus is God, and he's already shifted focus, hasn't he? He went from Jesus is God, and now we're talking about Isaiah the prophet. And he's, talk, and he's giving you a prophecy. And he's going to go on and talk about John the Baptist. So how are we to recognize then that Jesus is supreme? Well, I, I think Mark's trying to tell you something. The reason he has shifted focus is not to shift focus of a person. Actually, it's rather to emphasize and underscore who he's already talking about. Now, you and I know that. If you're a music fan... When you go to concerts, you paid a lot of money, you show up, and who comes out first? Not the star, not the main act. They have an opening act, sometimes several. Or if you go to a movie, they don't just press play and you get a movie. You get all these advertisements, all these commercials. You get all these previews or consider the president of the United States. He never comes out first. You see, the point is this, is they're always announced. One always comes before them. And so when Mark shifts your attention to looking at John the Baptist as some fulfillment in Isaiah, he's trying to underscore who it is that's coming after John the Baptist. It's not so that you and I recognize and get really excited about who John the Baptist is. He's trying to tell you, no, it's the guy right behind him. 
The fact that you know who John the Baptist is says you should know who this guy is. This is Jesus, God's son. And that's what's happening here. Think about it this way. God has just entered history in human flesh. And he did that in Jesus. Now, we're getting closer and closer to the Christmas story. And so that you and I tend to quickly think about that. Oh, well, we know that Jesus is God's son. Stop right there. Let it sink in for just a moment. This is the covenant making God. This is the covenant keeping God. Who enters history in human flesh to be with you. You recognize that's why we're here this morning. That's why you and I who have repented and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why you're Christians. It's because Jesus showed up for you. It's because Jesus showed up for me. That's why we're here. That's what Mark is trying to drive home. He is supreme. He is what is most important. He is what is centrally focused in all of humankind, all of human history. It's Jesus. And that's why John the Baptist says, we read it here in verse 7. After me comes he who is mightier than I. The strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. Who is Jesus? He's God. He's supreme. But he's not just supreme. Mark keeps going, doesn't he? He wants you to know something else. He's the savior. He's the rescuer, you might say, for us. Notice how after verse 8, I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. We get this picture of Jesus' baptism. But what you need to know before we even look into his baptism is Mark has already tried to tell you that Jesus came to save you. Did you catch it in verse 1? The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ, you've heard that word before. That's not a name, that's a title. That's the Greek word for anointed one or the Messiah. The Old Testament Jews were looking for one to come and save them. They longed for the anointed one. They longed for the Messiah. And so what they got right here in Mark's gospel, this man is the Christ. And then he continues. He gives them a name. He says his name is Jesus. You ever considered what that name might mean? You see, that's the Greek word for the Hebrew name. Joshua. Do you know what Joshua means? Yahweh will save. Yahweh saves. Are you following? In the very name of his son, he has tried to tell you, I have come for you. I am here to save you. You recognize in the name of Jesus you have a problem. I have a problem. We need a savior. Now you need to recognize and remember how do the Old Testament people name their children? The origin of a name back then was meant to represent something true of their life. And you've probably heard that before. Consider the man Abraham. Do you remember in Genesis when we find out what does Abraham's name mean? The father of many nations. Now, my wife and I, we tried to really emulate that principle, and it's something of a promise that we try to pray for our own children. So we have three boys. The oldest is Harper, Patton, or Patton Stephen, and then the last one, we call him Liam, but his name is William. And we gave them a name with a promise, saying, God, please make this true of their life. Harper, he's a, well, John Harper is the name of a Scottish pastor, and so we named him after this guy. Maybe you've heard a book by him. It's called The Titanic's Last Hero. He was a Scottish pastor who would come over to the States to speak at Dwight L. Moody conferences. And so on one occasion, he and his daughter got on the Titanic. You know the story of the Titanic. And so what happens is while they're on there, obviously the boat sinks. Didn't know if you knew that, but just ruined that movie for you and the story. While they're there, here they've hit the iceberg. The boat's starting to sink. And one of the crewmen is running up and down the docks and saying, women and children to the boats. Well, they see John Harper and they say, aren't you a pastor? And he said, yes. 
and said, will you help us get the women and children to the boats? And so he said, sure, absolutely. So John Harper's now running up and down the docks, but he's saying something very different. Women, children, and unbelievers to the boats. And he runs into a stranger and he says, unbeliever, who is that? And so John Harper takes a moment and shares the gospel with him. And as you read the story, the boat about that time cuts in two. It's capsizing and it's sinking. And so John Harper's daughter makes it to the boat. John Harper is put into the water and you feel like the story's left undone at that point. And then later on in the water, John Harper sees that man again. Sir, sir, have you received Christ? No, I haven't. And so then again, John Harper shares the gospel with him. Now, how do we have that story? Because that man came to Christ and was saved. And through him and his daughter, we get the story of John Harper. And so he said, Lord, would Harper know the gospel and share it to his dying breath? Well, then Patton, not the general, the missionary. You know him, the one to the New Hebrides in 1858. Have you ever heard about how these missionaries would go? Well, they didn't use suitcases. They used wooden coffins because they recognized the, li the likelihood of them coming back was slim to none. And so John Patton and his wife left in 1858, but right before they did, they had a strange encounter with an elder in their church. Listen to what this elder said. His name's Mr. Dick, uh, Dixon. John, you will be eaten by cannibals. This is how Patton responds. Mr. Dixon, you are advanced in years now. And your own prospect is soon to be laid in the grave, there to be eaten by worms. I confess to you that if I can but live and die serving and honoring the Lord Jesus, it will make no difference to me whether I'm eaten by cannibals or by worms. And so he said, God, help Patton give his life for the sake of the gospel. William, named after William Tyndale. And if you know anything about him. He, didn't, he did far more than this, but at the very least, he gave his absolute life for the translation of the Bible. And so he said, God, help Liam to love your word more than anything else. That's what's taking place here in the name of Jesus is you've got something true written on his name about who he is. And what he's saying to you is you and I have a problem. We have a sin problem. And so he's using John the Baptist to kind of overwhelm you and I to let you know we are in desperate need of rescue. We are in desperate need of saving. And so what do we get? Well, we get this story. We get this image, this picture of the baptism of Jesus. Look at what it says again. Look in verse 9. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was, and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water... Immediately, he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. W what's happening here? This is not a mistake story. Have you ever considered how the rest of the gospels begin? Matthew and Luke start at the beginning of Jesus's life. John starts at the beginning of before the foundation of the world. But Mark starts at a salvation focus and he uses baptism to teach you and I that. Have you ever considered what this means? You, you see, when we hear the word baptism, when we read this, we might be tempted to think, oh, okay, I got it. We know it's going to happen later on, not just in the gospel of Mark, but we know what Peter's going to say about it in Acts. We know what Paul's going to say it in 1 Corinthians 7. So maybe that's how they thought about it when they hear this story about Jesus' baptism. That's not true. These people didn't have the New Testament. They didn't have the rest of the story. They don't know what's going to happen. So why would Mark be telling them about the baptism of Jesus? How were they to understand anything about it? They would not have looked forward to inform them. They would have had to look Back. Back where? Well, the Old Testament. They would have had to look back into the Old Testament. And we recognize that the Old Testament will teach you some about baptism, right? It's, there's a ceremonial law that's for cleansing, for purification, for washing. That wouldn't have been their understanding. These are Gentiles. They would not have understood that. So where would they have looked to understand what is happening here? Might I suggest two stories? You remember that story in Joshua chapter 2? With a woman named Rahab? You know that story, right? 
two spies, they leave. They go into Jericho. They're looking to seek the enemy to figure out what's going on here. And when they're in there, the king finds out. And so Rahab hides them. And when she's got them hidden, do you know how she responds? Listen to what she says to them. This is Joshua chapter 2. We have heard how the Lord, Yahweh, dried up the water of the Red Sea when you came out of Egypt. For the Lord, your God, He is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. A Gentile woman, what does she say? We have heard. We have heard what? We have heard who? Yahweh, the one who dried up the Red Sea. He is God. What is Rahab looking to? She's going back a little bit further. So why don't we go with her? Exodus chapter 14. That's the famous good children's story, right? That's when Israel crosses the Red Sea. Moses has led them out of Egypt. Their backs are up against the water. And what does God tell Moses to do? Take your staff, Moses. Stretch it out in your hand and divide the sea. And what do we find out? When he puts it over, God divides the water. And you know what happens, don't you? Israel walks through. But what else happens? Egypt comes in after him. What are you and I to make of that? Well, the same water that brought life also brought judgment. You see, Israel and Egypt both were tossed into the sea. But God's grace saved Israel. You recognize that's salvation. Israel didn't earn that. They did nothing to deserve that. God's grace showed up and they were saved. And that's what Mark's driving home here in the baptism of Jesus. That's why it's so significant that the Trinity shows up. God Almighty is showing his approval of his son and saying, yes, this is him. He is the one who has come to save you. He is the one who has come to rescue you. Jesus goes into the waters for baptism. Why? Baptism is for cleansing. He doesn't have sin. He won't sin. There's no sin in him. Why is he going in there? Because he's going in where you and I must go. He goes into the waters to lead you out and ultimately take on God's judgment. You see, he becomes a greater Moses here. That's what the author of Hebrews is telling you about him. He's the greater Moses because he led you in, he took your punishment, and he leads you out. You see, this is taking place in the wilderness, and that's where we find our life. The wilderness, you remember those stories for Israel? That was the testing ground. But what would happen for Israel on their testing ground? The wilderness became a place of, uh, of repentance. Not so for Jesus. The wilderness was no place for repentance. No, you see, the wilderness for Jesus was a testing ground of reconciliation. You and I find our lives hidden in Christ when he goes to the wilderness on our behalf. And so what is Mark telling you here in the story of his baptism? He is fulfilling what we have messed up. He is undoing the wickedness of mankind. He's the Savior. He's supreme. But He's also the sufferer. He becomes a model for us. What do I mean by that? Let's look at verses 12 to 13 here. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals. And the angels were ministering to him. How quickly Mark has gone to tell you who he is and what he's done to now. Can you imagine what that sight, that scene should have been? Jesus has just been baptized. We ought to be having a party. There ought to be some form of reception, a celebration. And what does Mark tell you about Jesus's celebration? The spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. 
He doesn't get one. There is no party. There is no celebration. There is no reception. What do you and I find? The status of Jesus, God's son, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. What are they doing? They promote the kingdom of God. And to do that, to promote the kingdom of God, they take ground and defeat the enemy, Satan. And so he finds himself in the wilderness. This is not a GPS recalculating moment. This was not an accident. This was on purpose. Do you see the language? He was driven out. And he's out there for a reason. What would that reason be? I think two things. One, to fulfill all the hopes and promises that Israel, the church, would receive. And secondly, to show you what suffering looks like. What do I mean that he's fulfilling the hopes, the promises of Israel? Did you catch that detail that Mark gives you? Mark's not like Matthew or Luke. He's not telling you this whole story of the three temptations of Jesus and and how Jesus responds by uh, quoting Deuteronomy 6 in chapter 8 to Satan. Mark doesn't give you any of that information. What does Mark give you? He tells you how long he was there. Did you catch that number? He was there for how long? 40 days. Why 40? Because God's people... They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. One day for every year, perfecting obedience. What is required for heaven? There he is. There's the supreme savior. He's in the wilderness making way and undoing sinful mankind that there might be a way to the father. In the wilderness, 40 days for 40 years. He knows suffering. Did you catch that weird detail? Only Mark will tell you this detail. And he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals. And the angels were ministering to him. Why, why that detail? Wild animals. Well, in that time, wild animals in times of biblical history and even in the Old Testament, wild animals were more of a symbol. Sometimes, yes, an actual animal, but most of the time symbols, symbols of horror, symbols of danger. And so Mark is telling you, this is the place in which Jesus is. He is in a place of horror, a place of danger. Why is that important? Do you remember who Mark's writing to? He's writing to those Roman Gentile Christians. He's trying to tell them, take comfort. Who are these people? Well, these would have been God's people who sat under the rule and reign of Nero. Does that name ring a bell? This is the Nero who, as it was said, he had gardens lit ablaze all the time. Do you know how? He took Christians and tarred them. And lit him on fire for his own pleasure. This is God's people who are reading this book. They understand the historian Tacitus who would say something like this. They were covered with the hides of wild beasts and torn to pieces by dogs. These people are hurting. They're dying. They're afraid. And what do they need? They need to know Jesus knows their suffering. He knows their life. He was there with them, for them. He becomes a model in what it looks like to suffer for Christ. Unless you conclude that Mark is just kind of giving you a quick information to, to make a quick statement about his suffering. Do you remember how Mark finishes his gospel? In chapter 15, Jesus is on the cross. There's a Roman Gentile. Centurion guard. He looks up at the cross. This is what he said. He stands facing him. And he saw that in this way, he breathed his last. 
I think the reason why he says in this way is he understood this man is unjustly suffering. Do you remember how he finishes that statement? Truly, he was the son of God. There's the sufferer, the savior, and the supreme one hanging on a tree for all the world to see. And this is how Mark finishes his gospel. What, what, what's the point? He wants you to know Jesus knows your suffering. He knows my suffering. And why do we need to hear that word? Because we don't like it. We don't like it. We live in such a comfortable society. Why do we want to hear about suffering? Because it teaches you to long for heaven. It teaches you how to long for heaven. Our society is so affluent, we don't even understand their life. You see, these are people who understood the lifetime span was 30 to 40 years. They were losing their children at a 50% infant mortality rate. These people were being torn apart by Nero. All they knew was suffering. And when you incur such pain and suffering like that, do you know what begins to happen? You begin to long for something else or somewhere else. And that's what Mark is telling you. You see, we have contemporary culture theologians like Kenny Chesney. He writes a song called Everybody Wants to Go to Heaven. But nobody wants to go now. And every stanza, he's arguing for give me a comfortable life. Give me this enjoyable life. Yes, I want what I think heaven is about. But what I want more than anything is my good life right now. You see, that's not the history of God's people. That's not how God made it. That's not the effects of sin, is it? You know that. You go out and you proclaim the name of Jesus and most people don't just give you a high five. They don't welcome you with open arms. They don't ask more questions. No, they fire you. They unfriend you on Facebook if that's your big deal. You and I experience suffering when you identify with Jesus. And Mark is telling you he knows it. He's a model for you and I. Conclude with this. One time C.S. Lewis, if you've ever heard of him, the author of the Chronicles of Narnia, he was asked one time, why do the righteous suffer? His response, why not? They're the only ones who can take it. Why do the righteous suffer? Why not? They're the only ones who can take it. You see, it's because we have Jesus. The one who rules and reigns. The one who came to save and seek what is lost. And the one who has modeled suffering for us. Oh, dear friends, may it be true for us that we would long for heaven because we know who leads us there, but we know who secures us there. You can trust him and you can go to him because he knows your suffering and he's overcome the world. Would you do that? Go to him and trust him. Let me pray for us. O oh, gracious and good and heavenly Father, we're so thankful that such an ancient word is yet still contemporary. You tell us that it is living, that it is active. And so we pray, O oh God, would you be active in our own heart? Would you help us to see more of who Jesus is? Would you help us to long for heaven because we know who's there, who's taking us there, and who will keep us there. And it's all by grace. Lord, if there are people here even this morning who don't know you, would they see you in your supremeness? Would they see you in your suffering? And would they come to you because you can save them. And this we pray in your name, Jesus.
and for your glory. Amen.